you a happy Sabbath, my dear brothers and sisters from Stamborough Park. I bring you greetings from Harrow, Halsden, Sudbury, Seven Kings and Watford members of my district. First of all, I would hope that uh, even the current circumstances, you are safe and sound, eager to return to church as soon as possible. Secondly, I would like to thank Pastor Messenger for his gracious invitation to preach on this very Sabbath at your church, although with the pandemic and all, this is no longer possible. However, with the help of technology, we can still experience a virtual interaction, which I hope would be meaningful and relevant for all of us. Lastly, let me greet you all with the traditional Romanian Adventist Sabbath greeting, Pacea Domnului, which means God peace be with you. Martin Buber, the Austrian Jewish philosopher, in his book Tales of the Hasidim, tells a story about Rabbi Shima Bunim of Peshisha, one of the key leaders of Hasidic Judaism in 18th century Poland. It is a story about one of the favorite tales used by Rabbi Bunim in his teaching classes. The story go like this. After many years of intense poverty, which did not shake his faith in God, uh, Rabbi Esik of Krakow was told in a dream to live and search for a treasure in Prague under the bridge that leads to the royal palace. It was only after the dream repeated a third time when Rabbi Isaac decided to leave for Prague. It was a long and tiresome journey, about 180 miles. Finally, he arrived, but the bridge was guarded day and night, so the rabbi did not dare to start digging. However, he came every morning near the bridge and wandered around until evening. One day, the guardian-in-chief, intrigued by what he observed, asked him politely, what was he doing there? Was he looking for something or waiting for someone? Rabbi Isaac told him about his dream that driven him to come so far. The captain burst out laughing and then said, Oh, poor soul, with your blunted souls, you went on such a long trip for the sake of a dream. Well, that happens when you believe in dreams. Once I too was told in a dream to go to Krakow and to search in the house of a certain Jew called Isaac, the son of Yekel, and find the treasure apparently buried behind his stove. Isaac, the son of Yekel. I can even picture myself in that place where probably half of the residents are called Isaac and the other half Yekel, rummaging around through all the houses. And the God burst out laughing again. Upon hearing this, Rabbi Isaac gratefully bowed, returned home, dug up the treasure, and with part of it, built a prayer house called the Reb Isaac Reb Yekel School. After he had finished the tale, Rabbi Bunim used to say to his student, remember this story and receive its teaching that there is something that is nowhere to be found in the world, not even near the right and the holy, but there is a still a place where you can, it can be found. Typically to all Jewish tales, the driving force of the story is its paradoxical element. At the most descriptive level, the gist of the story could be easily resumed as follow. First, often, what you are looking for is at hand, in your world, your house, maybe your heart. Second, to find that, you must take a long detour, to come back to yourself from afar, to walk a distance. Third, sometimes it's better to be naive than, than, than skeptic or doubtful. Fourth, to take the dream seriously, you don't need to abandon your discernment. Five, when you find it, do not keep the treasure just for yourself, share it. Six, the solution is around, but to find it, you may need the salutary intervention of a stranger. And the last one, when the opportunity came, do not hesitate, grab it immediately. It could be once in a lifetime. However, we are attracted to the allegorizing side of the tale too. 
it's tempting to contemplate that way. I mean, who represents the rabbi? What is the treasure? What about a dream? Who the stranger is? What the distance stands for? Etc. Now, the story is not a parable per, per, per se. It is a Hasidic tale, a fictional but useful illustration that operates with powerful existential elements. Essentially, it's about a quest. Start searching for something. To what precisely, you might ask? There must be something specific, possessing an aura of a treasure. Hard to find, but worthy of effort and time. Could be a profession or the family, material possessions or spiritual achievement, moral perfection, a special person, a just cause, a philanthropy or simply plain survival. Or maybe life itself with us trying to get a firm grip on it to live as long as possible. But let us switch the focus now from the individual to the collective. Where are we now as a church? A church that embarked herself on a mission of proclaiming the present truth to the whole world and preparing the way for the second coming. But, you know, we are perceived as poor and wretched, as the rabbi from the tale, and as Jesus surgically was describing the last church of Revelation. However, we have the dream, the vision, right? Are we not the chosen ones, despite our shortcomings? Are we not destined for great things in this world and the world to come? Uh, well, sounds comforting, yes, but maybe it's just the echo chamber sound, hearing precisely what we are uttering. Let's have a genuine conversation here. Here's my challenge. Did we find the treasure yet? And how do we know we found it? Now, before answering that, allow me to digress a bit from the main metaphor, the treasure hunting. We need a better understanding of our current predicament, especially as a church who profess to be the guardian of the present truth and the final events. Let us start with 19th century America, the birthplace of our movement, the particular context in which we came to the Adventist light. A bizarre but cheerfully anthem was circulating in that time, trumpeting with confidence that we are living, we are dwelling in a grand and awful time, in an age on ages telling to be living is sublime. Indeed, it seemed sublime to live in that America, having every reason to be optimistic. The long-awaited millennium was knocking at the door. The thousand years of peace and prosperity were about to be ushered through social reforms, political mechanism, national progress, and personal development. The new millennial package included universal peace and justice, collective salvation, a land devoid of the original curse, health and healing, in a word, a capitalist golden age. America would be more than it was and great again. Suddenly, without warning, the crisis hit through the so-called 1837 panic, which defrauded Americans of every bit of optimism. And if they would still flirt with any vague hope of the advertised millennium, it was shattered by no one than William Miller, a Baptist preacher in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Against this background, the reluctant pioneer of the Advent movement came up with a radical message. The long-awaited golden age was a naive, but nonetheless a dangerous utopia. The world would not last. It will enter its final lockdown on 22 October 1844. Miller prophetically it foretold the end of the world at a time when many were waiting for the beginning of the millennium. One historian of America's religions remarked, no wonder 
it took a long time for Americans to forget William Miller. The end did not come in 1844. It couldn't come, we reflect now in retrospect. And yet, an end did come. The end of the seductive illusion, the myth of progress, the belief that humans have the capacity through technological development and political will to radically transform the world into imaginary commonwealth paradise. Then came the confirmation, the civil war, 1861 to 1865, the most traumatic event in American history, and the two world wars of the 20th century. The rest is history, as you know, but not the denomination that was born in 1844 from the great disappointment, a religious movement that recycled the end time theme as raw material for modeling a particular philosophy of history, an apocalyptic vision of the future. Adventism was born into an end time paradigm and always professed that the, the end of history is the reason why the church exists as a denominational necessity. I do not intend to draw forced and decontextualized parallels. When it comes to history, I prefer the paradox inspired by Solomon and Heraclitus. There is nothing new under the sun, and yet nothing is the same because everything changes. But the question arises, if we came across to an end, how should we advance? What would be the answer? Jeremiads undoubtedly have their places in our preaching, and not a few rushes to them. Even the call to repentance and the perpetual urge for revival and reform suddenly become relevant. But uh, except for recalling the ancient plagues and Psalm 91, the most quoted psalm of this crisis, conspiracy theories and veiled accusation that we are hiding behind Skype and Zoom meetings, what are we left with? How do we now manage an almost dissolved distinction between the seventh day and the rest of the days? How to live in a continuous state of rest at home, a kind of never-ending sabbatical? And when it comes to working from home, is there a still a meaningful difference between public and private life? Is the church, if the church no longer has access to its walls, nor to the physical congregation between her members, or being able to organize regular religious activities, does it have any legitimacy as a digital entity? How to solve the tension between the natural and healthy impulse to isolate and sincere desire not to cave in, but to find alternative ways to be useful to others without the danger of infection? Who could have predicted that day would come when the ordinary virus would paralyze an entire world, suddenly forcing us to stop literally and to radically redefining familiar concepts like relationship, work, transport, food, economy, tourism, culture, religion, hospitality, that we will enter against our will into a new strange reality. A reality where the line between paranoia and balanced sense of actuality will become increasingly blurred and vague. A reality where the state of lockdown will condition our behavior from a long time from now on. A reality where we shall socially distance ourselves, not only from the world which we have always pretended to, but even from the church and the religious activities. Those temporal and spatial stopgaps that somehow maintain the illusion that through weekly participation, we are still the chosen ones. Is the church ready to deal 
with an end that always was preached with religious devotion, but paradoxically postponed by a secular pa pragmatism. Adventism's response to the 2020 crisis is supposed to be deeper than articulating some creative methods to religiously survive in lockdown and beyond the assurance that after this will be business as usual. No, it won't be. Church life will no longer be the same because we will no longer be the same. What would be our message then? Stay, pray and pray? Yes, it is imperative to protect ourselves physically and spiritually in a very necessary literal form of isolation. However, in a major crisis like this, the greatest need is that of a leadership, exactly what the religious or secular prophets always did, indicating direction, clarity and assurance in history's darkest times. Maybe we should prophesy again, but what should we prophesy in this current setting? Uh, Sunday laws and natural treatments, 100 days of prayer, health and temperance, leaving the big cities. The truth is that during the 175 years of our denominational history, we have missed significant moments. Moments when we should have been leading those who preached the end with passion and courage. Or maybe not the end of time, but the end of some dreadful realities. For example, the end of slavery, the end of the oppression of Victorian workers, the end of the violence against women, the end of exploitation of children, the end of the racial and ethnic discrimination, the end of the abuses of totalitarian governments, the, the, the end of the wild capitalism and social inequity, the end of the systematic destruction of the environment, and so on. It is not the work of a prophet to raise his or her voice against the evil of society, to direct the public in the right direction, even if history, as we know, is no kind to those who do not prophesy well. If you keep quiet, Christ warned us, the stones will cry out. But only stones shouted and protested against the sinister realities of our society while we were silent and socially distancing ourselves from them and still waiting for a particular end that did not come. Back then, we should have preached those ends with plural in order to qualify now to proclaim the end singular. We can speculate as much as we want about what sort of end we are dealing with. Maybe it's one of the many that have interacted with our history, an end that radically changes the direction. In this sense, the end is behaving like a virus, always mutating to successfully attach to its host. Rarely did we manage to recognize those mutations. Or maybe, maybe we are dealing with the one we have been waiting for, the last one, the end, for which we are never ready because it's different than we have expected it. Even in the most fanciful scenarios, the church could not foresee the current crisis. There was no room in our prophetic timetable for China's globaling presence, the rise of the social networks, the standardization of the public discourse, the algorithmization of the everyday life, the social distancing, the deterioration of America's influence, the flickering aura of the papacy, the proliferation of the social protests, the climate change, the, the, the domination of the multinationals, and now, on top of that, a full-fledged pandemic. It seems that we are entering a new era, a post-pandemic coronavirus world. 
Now, what is our place in this strange, cold, unfamiliar, not yet dystopian, but grim reality? As Seventh-day Adventists, we always advertise ourselves as the true guardians of the prophecy and the final events. We thought we knew what was about to happen and ready to proclaim it. Only that, in the past 175 years, we rarely were able to anticipate anything. What are we supposed to preach and do in times like these? What is our distinctive message? What is the core of Adventism now? And I'm not referring to the London-based one-week preaching program, a good opportunity for reclaiming our denominational theological roots. No, what I mean is our perpetual quest to unveil and proclaim the present truth. Let's reflect on this question. You may remember this parable from Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. A short by dynamic parable, five verbs in one verse. Found, covered, goes, sells, buys. But there are two separate challenges here. Finding the treasure and buying the field. In that order, you cannot pursue just one. You may find the treasure, but cannot own it if you are not buying the field. Or you can buy the field with enough hope that you may find it with a big if. Some are ready to buy the field without finding the treasure first. This is when we are saying we have the truth. But do we? I don't know. Maybe an idea, a shadow, a form without really possessing the truth. The truth with capital T. Actually, we are not searching for it, really, simply because we believe that we already have it. It's just a matter of interpretation, we say, not identification. The treasure is ours and ours only. Well, this is a bold and seductive idea, but having the collateral effect of preventing us to keep searching for the treasure, we may have the map but it is not the same as the field or the territory. Let's not get confused here. But it should be around in this Adventism perimeter, you might say. We were led to this field by the early dreams and visions. We know it's here. But you know that the kingdom is not obvious according to the parable. Neither it is at the surface. We need to explore it, to investigate it is not a thing, but a certain reality we should dig for. However, I fear that few are digging. To what extent are we willing to go into this existential quest? You may remember that uh, it took the rabbi a long time, 60 hours of walking the distance from Krakow to Prague, only to find nothing under that bridge. And this is not a desired experience. Still, it is a biblical truth that to find something, you need to experience nothing. It sounds crazy, I know, but there you have it. Remember the beginning. Before life, it was void. Before light, it was darkness. Before something, it was nothing. That was a terrifying perspective Nicodemus was presented with. When Jesus laid out just one option, you need to start again, to start over. You must die before coming alive. There is no other way around. Christ said that only if the grain dies, it bears fruit. John 12, 24. With the shocking conclusion of verse 25, he who loves his life we lose it. What can we do then? Well, 
The easiest option would be the acclimatization. It's just another crisis. We'll get over it, changing a little here, a little there, just to remain the same. That means identifying digital, logistical, communicational resources to prevent the translation of social distance into a religious and denominational alienation. But the hard option would be the transformation that involves a restart of the religious, social, even the organizational experience. Well, that would pose a serious challenge to our present condition. But Jesus said that the new wine cannot be poured into the old wine skin. Both would be damaged. Now we can renew it because we have time and nowhere to go except to the only one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, let us remember and summarize. Often, what we are looking for is at hand in our world, our house, our heart. To find that, we must take a long detour to come back from ourselves to walk a distance. Sometimes it's better to be naive than skeptic or doubtful. To take the dream seriously, we don't need to abandon our discernment. When find it, the treasure, don't keep it just for ourselves. Let's share it. The solution may be around, but to find it, we may need the salutary intervention of a stranger. When the opportunity comes, do not hesitate. Grab it immediately. It could be once in a lifetime. It is my sincere prayer that we are up to the task and follow the vision and start digging again in our personal and denominational perimeter to retrieve the treasure. How do we know we found the treasure? The biblical answer is this. When we have sold everything else, that's the only way. Only then we can prophesy again and the world will know that there is a prophet around. Only then our message will get true and the truth will shine. And only then we would be ready for the end, whatever that end might be. May God grant us precisely what we need most. Amen. Amen.